Hey guys, welcome to the channel, as you see in the thumbnail what if, Issei is approached by Azathoth part 4. Before I start, please do support for more awesome content, and subscribe my channel and like this video, let's start this video. See you at school, sweetheart. Issei paused, folding his hands together and pointing in front of him. Okay, so let me get this straight. That's not Aza. Walking down the street was someone that did appear to be Aza, waving back at him as she walked on, but Issei could tell there was something off. Wrong. It didn't feel like Aza. Some buzz or spark about her was missing. Along with the sensation of otherworldliness just behind the thin veil of reality. But it definitely looked like her human body, and he had gotten very familiar with said body. Indeed, Gaktha confirmed. It is a distortion of reality, filling in the perceived role of her human persona in her absence. She is aware of all it does, as it is an extension of her will. And her human form isn't. Issei countered curiously. The macabre eldritch paused in consideration. That is a conscious effort, this is subconscious. Ah, so this is Aza literally on autopilot, Issei mused. Don't suppose I'll be able to do that anytime soon? I am not aware, master. I know little of how your ascension operates, Gakta informed. Right. Where is she going, anyway? Issei asked, watching the not Aza curiously. We just passed my house, so not there. She will disappear once all humans that know of her mortal identity cease watching her, Gakta elaborated. Ah, Issei said with a nod. Master, you still are considered human by this power, Gakta clarified. Issei suddenly stopped, looking very sheepish. Right, I should have picked up on that. So, guess you'll be heading off to do whatever you do when you're not watching me. Gakta nodded before tilting her head. Master, could you please hold out your arms? Issei blinked but did as she requested. Like this. Yes, now please brace yourself, Gakta said before vanishing into mist and shadows. Wait, wow wow Issei exclaimed as something suddenly fell into his grasp. Someone, rather. My hero, Aza greeted teasingly, him on the cheek, her arms wrapped around his neck. Aza? Did you just drop out of the sky? Issei exclaimed in surprise. Yes, yes I did, Aza answered with a giggle. I K, okay, fair enough, but a little warning next time. Issei requested, unable to resist smiling at her. Aza tilted her head at him. That's what Gakta is for. And she was horrible with a warning, Issei mused with a chuckle. Miss me. Every instance, Aza said, snuggling into his dot did you miss me? Issei grinned, holding her close. Oh hell yes, but I've been keeping myself busy. I've heard, Oz acknowledged before smirking against his body, stronger than when she left. And I can feel it. You've been training. A bit, but come on, you don't have to stroke my ego all the time, Issei said, grinning widely. Oz leaned up to his ear and whispered. What should I stroke then? Issei stiffened, in more ways than one. Oz let out a laugh as Issei suddenly turned and started walking, herself still carried in his arms. Issei, where are you going? She asked in between giggles. My room, Issei answered bluntly, making her turn scarlet, but very excited. Mind time freezing my parents. You know, if you haven't. Not a problem, B-E-L-O Aza stopped mid-sentence as they reached the door. Issei paused, looking at her in concern. What? What happened? Did a star go supernova or something? No, there's someone in your house, Oz informed with a frown, suddenly leaping out of his arms and landing on her feet. And they're not human. Added Issei concerned, forming his red gauntlet on his hand. Without warning, Aza snapped the door open, her powers ready to strike down the intruder that might threaten her beloved's family. Wow hi boss. The seemingly human female greeted in surprise, looking ready to jump off the couch. Er, bosses, I guess, she said, glancing at Issei. Aza stilled and tilted her head while Issei lowered his fist awkwardly and dispelled the gauntlet. Okay, who are you and why are you in my house? Issei asked curiously. Zothra, queen, she explained quickly. You know, the hidden devourer. Aza stared uncomprehendingly for a long tense moment before blinking. Wait. Are you the worm that works for Hydra? Worm? Issei muttered curiously. Yes, Sultana, that is me, Zothra answered, nodding quickly. Sorry, um, I believe this is the first time we met in person. Oh, okay, Aza said with a nod before frowning. What are you doing in my beloved's home? Zothra held up her hands in surrender. I, I was expecting Mistress Yudra to be here. They said she had business with the Kunger. She did. That's done, Aza answered flatly, making Zothra uneasy. Issei sighed and placed a hand on Aza's shoulder, her annoyance dispersing as she looked up at him in surprise. It's fine, Aza. It's not like she did anything to my parents, he said before looking at others with a raised eyebrow. Right. Um Zothra looked vaguely confused. They're not home. Oh, Aza and Issei said in sync. Sorry about that, Issei apologized. But, yeah, Yudra's not coming back here. Um, actually sir. I'm here for both of you, Zothra explained their interest. Lady Yidra had me go see the leader of the fallen angels about what he wanted to give you. Oh. She knew about that. 
Issei asked curiously. Idra knows almost everything important that happens on Earth, Oz explained casually. I honestly don't care about the rest of them, but I don't turn down free offerings. So, what is it? Zothra sighed in relief as she held out her hand over the couch. Issei was mildly disgusted by the swarming worms that suddenly came out of every hiding spot in the living room, forming a mass on the furniture. Then, just as quickly as they came, they scurried away and out of sight, hopefully out of existence, and left behind the offering in question. And Issei's disgust was forgotten as he looked at the very cute foreign girl that appeared, lying peacefully on the couch. Blonde, pretty, small, lovely little, and an unoutfit of all things. Okay, controlling my perversion for five minutes, who and what is that? Issei asked with wide eyes. Is she an angel princess or something? No, Issei, she's human, Aza answered with a head tilt. What's so special about her? She's got one of those things Yahweh made. Apparently, it's great for healing, Zothra answered, shrugging. He thought it'd be helpful for you both. Something to heal the Kunger, in case he needs it. As for the girl, well, she's for the Kunger. Issei raised an eyebrow. Aren't both those points to me? No, no, that's fair, Aza agreed, patting his arm. So, what should we do with her? Praising, Issei muttered. Well, we kind of need to talk with her. We do? Aza asked in confusion. What, you just going to mind warp her into being a priestess or something? Issei asked rhetorically. Silence greeted him. Aza, no. Well, it's an option, Aza defended. Yeah, but that's jumping the gun a bit, and I just agreed that mind warping her is an option, Issei said with a facipum. How do we even wake her up? Oh, that's easy, Aza said as she snapped her fingers. The girl hummed and stirred. What did you do? Issei asked idly. Induced insomnia. That always breaks sleeping spells and curses, Aza explained with a smile. Issei blinked as he thought about that. Can't argue with that logic, he mused. Since I delivered the package, am I okay to leave now? Zothra asked cautiously. Aza nodded, prompting an uncertain wave from Issei. Thanks. Um, dig by some time, I guess. Any time, Kunger, Zothra managed to grin before heading out the door. The sound of it closing caused their new arrival to abruptly sit up with wide eyes. She looked around owlishly before looking at the couple before her. Ciao, Kaisei. Dove Sono. She asked in what was not Japanese. So Issei was mildly surprised that he understood her. Um, hi. I'm Issei and this Aza, he greeted. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to use Japanese, she returned, and Issei was even more surprised by how good her Japanese was. I'm Asia. Asia Argento. I'm in Japan then. Yes, yes you are, Aza answered with a head tilt. What exactly did the Fallen tell you? Asia looked down in thought. It's a bit hazy. But I remember Lord Azazel telling me that Raynor had been using me and gone rogue. And in that she was dead. Well, not exactly dead, Aza murmured to herself. Issei chose not to address that. Aichi didn't say what happened exactly, just that she might have nearly started a war, Asia continued. I, I asked if there was anything I could do to help and Asia stopped and slowly looked back up at the two. What? Something on my face. Issei asked in concern. I don't mean to be rude, but if you don't mind, may I ask what you both are? She asked nervously. Eldritch gods, Aza answered with a smile. Silence reigned over the room as Issei silently sent a prayer scolding Aza for her bluntness. Meanwhile, where is that bitch? Freed grunted as he sat in the kitchen that belonged to some devil summoning sinner. At least it did before he had spilled their brains all over the living room. He had been sleeping in the abandoned church, but it was truly abandoned now. The fallen angels and other exorcists had flown the coop without telling him anything. Why, he didn't know. Probably the devils or someone had raided the place and made them move. But they should have found him by now. Or at least stopped ignoring his attempts to summon Raynor. He needed a damn update on what the plan was. Now he was reduced to killing off sinners to loot their homes for food, money, and the occasional shower. Not the first time he had to live like that. Life as an excommunicated exorcist wasn't pretty some days. Not the blood, the blood was plenty pretty. But not his body odor after a week without a way to clean up. Ah, who am I kidding, it's not just her, he said, taking a swig of some alcohol he found in the fridge. Everyone's gone silent. Fallen, ex-exorcists. I swear to God's crusty balls, I'll gut someone if I find out the war started somewhere else, and I got left out. Wouldn't it be God's rotting balls? Freed turned and shot at the speaker, aiming right between the bitch's eyes. She raised an unamused brow as the bullet slowed to a crawl. With a sigh, she brandished her sword and gently pushed the bullet aside. Seeing as God is dead and all. She continued idly. Who are you supposed to be? King Arthur's sister of a daughter? Freed asked, eyeing the young woman with a cape, European sword, and armor over the lower half of her legs and arms. My name is Yad Thadag, she answered solemnly. I'm an elder god. Freed blinked before he let out a mad, high-pitched laugh. Oh, bravo sugar bitch. That's a good one. 
You're a tentacle space god tossed up in a cute girl's body. Right. Now, let me guess. You're the one this sinner was summoning, right? Here to show him a good time? Did he tell you to pretend to be some tentacle girl that could his ass? Gad looked less than amused. I can see why she wants you. Oh? Who? The dream witch. The old dreamer in rely. Freed asked mockingly. Freed froze. The air got cold, and the lights dimmed unnaturally while the shadows began to flicker. H hey, you stupid bitch. You shouldn't say their names. Especially if you know they're real. Freed called out in warning. Nyarlathotep. Something giggled. Freed spun around and shot blindly into the shadows. He looked in every direction, his gunshots echoing far longer than they should. Are you scared, Freed Selzen? Yad asked quietly. Shut your trap, bitch. Are you trying to get us killed? You want that eldritch watching us? Freed shot back as he turned to her. He stopped. A whimpering struggled out of his throat as he looked at Yad and saw what was behind her. She was already watching you, Freed, Yad answered with a head shake. But you're too much trouble to let her have. So, she stepped aside. From a dark corner emerged blue and black smoke. From it through it came some creature. It was like a hound, but larger. A hound with tentacles for a snout with blue puss dripping from the twisted flesh of its body. It had no eyes, but it could see him. It could see him. Be the hound of Tindalos, Freed murmured in terror. The attack dog of time. Why you were telling the truth, yes, Yad finished. This one will take you somewhere far from here, Freed. Some place where even the black pharaoh won't try to you. W wait. J just wait. Freed demanded as he backed away. I, you don't understand. I don't care, Yad mused. I could say sorry, beauty can't even bother to pretend for you. Why ya? Yeah? Well, you and this dog. Freed yelled as he shot at the hound and made a run for the door. He turned the corner and the dog was there, the long tendrils of its mouth pulling aside to show the horrific maw that lay within. Freed screamed. He screamed as he fell backward and tried to crawl away. No, no, no. You can't escape, Yad remarked as she watched without compassion. The hound lives in every angle of time, and he would never stop hunting you. In pure desperation, Freed threw his empty gun at the eldritch beast. It bounced harmlessly off the hound, the gun making itself into a crude and unrefined chunk of metal, falling to the floor with a thud. No, 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 Freed kept muttering, eyes feeling like they were going to pop out. Get away, stay aw with G-A-H-H-H-H. The hound snatched onto his arm, more like a serpent than a canine. It reared up, holding the screaming and panicking Freed in its maw. With a gurgling howl, it leaped forward, into the nearest corner and, with a final terror-filled scream cut off, Freed Selzin vanished from the earth. Yad stood there, saying not a word. Um, pity, I was going to have fun with that one. Yad turned and stared pointedly at the figure in the darkness. You have plenty more toys. That one would have brought about the ending of this earth if you empowered and unleashed him. My, so certain. Did your bigger self tell you that? Nyerly asked toyingly. I suppose it doesn't matter. Just don't think I'll let you take away all the interesting pawns, Diriad. Yad frowned as a pair of hands placed a comforting hold on her shoulders. I wonder what you would do if you just disappeared for a while. Nyerly mused with a wicked grin in her voice. Nothing you'd enjoy, Yad warned tensely. Mm, maybe, maybe not, Nyerly purred before the shadows began to lessen. Until next time, little key. Yad shook her head as she cut her own portal in reality, muttering to herself. Yog, you deal with her next time. Meanwhile, it had taken a little bit to explain everything to Asia. Issei is not yet an eldritch god, but becoming one. And this all started because Raynor tried to kill both of you, not knowing that you are the, well, eldritch queen. Asia summarized. And I was given as a sacrifice to make sure you don't retaliate more against the fallen. But she took it all pretty well. That's more or less it, yeah, Issei answered with a shrug. Any questions? I, I have a few, but Asia trailed off, looking back and forth between them. Why am I still sane? I was always told by the church that the Eldritch destroys a person's sanity. We can reign it in while having a human avatar, Aza answered. Well, I can. Issei only makes me insane right now. Horrible compliment, but thanks, Issei said, understanding what she meant. Oh. I see, Asia said as she turned solemn. Am I going to be killed as part of a ritual? Aza hummed. That depends on, Aza, no. Just hell no, Issei said flatly. What? I was just going to ask if she wanted to become an Eldritch creature. That kind of counts as dying, Aza said with a shrug. I'm sure Shub wouldn't mind. May he ask what happens if I refuse, your majesty? Asia asked respectfully. Hmm? Oh, nothing, Aza answered with a flip of the hand. Asia, right. There is only one thing I want from you. Asia nodded slowly. I want you to help keep my beloved safe, Aza said, waving to say. Safe? Me? Asia asked in surprise. B, but I can't fight or anything. My twilight healing is only good for healing, exactly, Aza said with a smile. 
which means if something does somehow happen to him, you can make sure he'll be okay. Right here you know, Issei remembered, feeling like she was talking like he wasn't present. Asia blinked. That's all. You don't want me to help you hurt anyone? I don't need help with that, Aza said casually. Asia, Issei is genuinely the most important thing in all the cosmos to me. Issei tried not to blush at that. What was he supposed to do when his girlfriend casually said something so sweet and genuine? And he'll be very upset if his human body is killed, and he'll have to wait so long before Harry forms, Aza continued. Well, still sweet and genuine, if not a bit weird to think about. Asia stared into Aza's eyes for a moment before smiling. You truly love him, don't you, Lady Aza? She asked softly. I have since the first time we met, Aza answered with a whimsical smile. Asia nodded. I understand. But may I make one request that might be unwelcome? She asked, cautious yet hopeful. Only one? Issei asked in surprise. Du was hoping it was okay, even though you are both eldritch gods if I continued praying to God. Asia asked gently. Issei swore she looked like a little angel herself. That's fine, Asia, Issei promised, looking at Aza, who had been about to say something. It is, right. Is there some rule that she has to worship an eldritch god now? Aza closed her mouth. No, there's not, she answered, still having a weird look on her face. But, Asia looked to the queen in concern. Well, I just don't know why you humans are still worshipping a dead god, Aza said curiously. I mean, eldritch gods come back, but terrestrial gods either pass on to an afterlife or are reborn, so, wow, 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 Issei said in surprise. God, the god from the bible, is dead. Um, yeah. Aza answered in bewilderment. Is that not common knowledge? He's been dead for a little while now. Asia just stared for a moment before promptly collapsing, fainting back into unconsciousness. Oh, shit. Issei cursed as he raced over to her. Okay, she just fainted. I think you broke her, Aza. I did. Aza asked in bewilderment. But I didn't even use my powers. Not like that, I mean she's in shock, Issei clarified, giving Aza a frown. Could you have delivered that a bit more delicately? I didn't know she didn't know. Aza defended before looking worried. Are you mad at me? No, just tired of everything going on right now, Issei asked with a sigh. I just wanted to go another round with you in bed and snuggle, but then this whole mess starts. Things are happening quicker than I'm used to, Aza admitted. I'm tempted to just blame Yogg, Issei mused. Aza, I'm sorry to be a wet blanket after we were about to, you know. Aza giggled at what he was implying. But you know a way we can hide her without my parents finding out? He asked curiously. Aza tilted her head. We could just send her to one of the cultists, she recommended. Ignoring that they'd probably try to brainwash her, she'd just be waking up in another new place with more strangers, Issei murmured. Aza hummed. I think I have an easy fix. Bring her up to your room. Issei raised an eyebrow and obliged her. They stood in Issei's room as Aza looked around, either taking it in or looking for something. Anything I should do? Issei asked curiously. Hold her tight, Aza advised. I'm about to do some minor reality warping. Issei wasn't sure what was more alarming. How casually she said that or how casually he accepted it. Still, he heeded her words as Aza suddenly stopped. Issei felt a brush of Aza's power washing over them, making Asia shudder and curl into his embrace. He tightened his hold and sighed as she settled. Aza hummed a small tune to herself as she approached Issei's closet. We're going to hide her in my closet. Issei asked dubiously. Nope. Aza said with a wide smile as she opened the closet to reveal we'll come to your second bedroom, Issei. Issei gawked as he stepped in to find that the small space had indeed now expanded and formed into an exact copy of the room they were just in, the closet leading into the door. Granted, all of the colors were a shade duller or darker. This, um, is safe, right? Yep. Aza answered. I mean, making it could have hurt someone's sanity, but as it is now. Just a few strange dreams here and there, nothing serious or mind-altering. The best part is, if your parents open it, they'll just see your closet. Okay, I'm going to admit, this is very useful, Issei admitted as he entered the other room, placing Asia down on the bed carefully. Out of pure curiosity, he walked over to the other closet, opening it to reveal his closet, his actual closet. Were you expecting another room? Aza asked in amusement. I wouldn't have been surprised, Issei admitted as they exited the other room. She can get out of there on her own, right? Oh yes, she'll be fine, Aza said as she closed the closet. So, wh ga. Issei found himself silenced as Aza turned sharply, placing her on his. I'm guessing you're still in the mood. He asked with a small grin, placing a hand on her hips. I'm always in the mood for you, beloved, Aza said with an absolutely hungry look in her eyes. Anything you want to try, ISSEI she all but purred with her arms around his neck. Aza inhaled sharply as she found herself off her feet, Issei cupping her ass. Not just to grope her, but to hold her up. With little prompting, she found her legs wrapped around his back. 
Though I might put my new strength to good use, he said smugly. Ever heard of stand and deliver, Aza? Aza starred in lust before capturing Issei's mouth again, tongue lashing as she grinded her pelvis against his. The Og sighed as she sat on the roof of Issei's home, spinning her sword in her fingers as she kept Issei's parents temporarily looping, driving down the street endlessly while not realizing it. This was the price she paid for letting the meeting with Zothra play out as it had. It was amusing, but if Issei's human parents showed up now and interrupted those two, Azathoth would be pissed. She didn't need to peek into the future to know that. Should have just sent the nun to Ika, Yogg mused absently. Dealing with the Asia situation had been an easy but uncomfortable thing for Issei. Just hiding her in his room all the time was well, it wasn't impossible, but Issei thought it would be a bit on the cruel side to keep her in a glorified cage in the shape of his bedroom. However, despite her initial shock and existential crisis, Asia had been very understanding and compliant with everything, which led to the current conversation. Do you want to go to school with Issei? Aza asked curiously, sitting on the bed in Asia's room. School, Lady Aza. Asia said in surprise, eating a bowl of rice at the desk. Yeah. That's normal for humans at your stage, right? Aza asked, tilting her head. Well, yes. And I would love to, but is that really okay? Asia asked demurely. I don't want to be a bother. Aza waved her hand dismissively. Oh, it's not. We'll have the paperwork warped into existence by tomorrow. Asia smiled, relaxing more as she ate. Thank you Lady Aza. I'm grateful to you and Lord Issei, but it will be nice to go outside. I understand, staying to such limited dimensions makes me feel cramped as well, Oz amused before blinking. Oh, right. Didn't Issei say he wanted you to drop calling us Lord and Lady? W well, yes, but I didn't want to offend you, eh Aza, Asia answered with a nervous edge to her voice. See, that wasn't so hard, Aza said with a smile. I'm really not that into formal titles. We mainly use the men nicknames, so we don't accidentally invoke each other. Invoke? Asia repeated. Do you mean how calling the name of the Eldritch will get their attention? If someone said your name randomly, you'd look toward them as well, Aza pointed out with a giggle. But yes. We can say each other's name without invoking each other, but it's an easy slip of the tongue. Kind of like calling someone by accident on those radiophones. Asia soaked that knowledge in politely. What about Issei? Should I call him something else? No, no, that shouldn't be an issue for a while, Aza assured. Though, getting back on the subject. Do you want to live here, or with Issei? Asia blinked, twice. Isn't that the same thing? Oh no. If you live with Issei, officially, we have to tell his family and you can use the rest of the house, Aza explained. But we can also just make it so that this room has another door leading outside. You'll have your own address and everything. Asia made a noise in understanding. You mean officially, as in for my papers. Aza nodded eagerly. My papers just keep making anyone who reads them not worry about the address. Though, Issei says I could look into getting something called a P.O. box. Asia nodded absently. I mean, I don't want to be a bother, but won't it be a problem if his parents run into me? Probably not, they still don't know about Aza, Issei's voice came through the door. Can I come in? Of course, Issei, Asia called back, Aza's face lightening up, as it always did whenever Issei entered the area. Were you listening in? Just the last bit, Issei answered as he entered the room, holding out a book. Here, Asia, I got this for you. The nun took the offered item, gasping as she looked it over. A Bible. Wait, this is my Bible where did you go? Aza sniffed, her entire skin moving unnaturally on her body, as it shuddered independently of the muscles beneath. It smells of the feathered pests, Aza remarked in distaste. Beloved, where were you? Well, Asia said she was in the care of the fallen angels that attacked us, and she was supposed to go to the abandoned church. So I went to check out their hideout, Issei confessed. Do not fret, Queen of the Eldritch. There was no issue, Drag informed. The church is long abandoned. Asia gasped, staring at the green light on Issei's hand. Issei. Your hand just talked. Issei scratched his cheek apologetically. Yeah, sorry, been meaning to introduce you too. You know Asia. Asia, this is Drag, my sacred gear. Your sacred gear can talk. Asia said in surprise. Of course. I am no mere trinket, for I am Drag, the Red Dragon Emperor, Drag said proudly. Asia looked suitably awed, Aza casually chiming in. He's also helping Issei protect himself until the Eldritchification really gets going. Anyway, Issei cut in quickly. Aza, I actually need to ask you something. You didn't send anyone after the Fallen Angels, did you? Huh? No, why? Aza asked curiously. Well, the place was pretty abandoned. As in, it looked like the Fallen left there in a rush, Issei mused. But if it wasn't you, well, it still might have been because of you. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I'm following. Asia asked cautiously. Oh, apparently a lot of the supernaturals decided to head back to their home realms while I'm on my extended mortal-themed honeymoon with my dear Issei, Aza said with a smile. 
So, even though I didn't go after them, they probably ran off anyway. Which brings us to the other issue, Issei murmured, looking at Asia apologetically. Asia, would you mind putting off enrolling in the academy for another week? Asia tilted her head at that. I suppose not, but may I ask why? There are a lot of devils there. Like, a lot, a lot, Issei explained awkwardly. And they're all running back to hell within the next day or two. I'm not seeing the problem, Aza said innocently. Which may indeed be part of the problem, Drag remarked quietly. I just don't want to stir things up even more until they leave. I don't think Rhea's club would try anything, but I don't know about the student council. Especially since Asia has a sacred gear, Issei explained. Oh. Oh, Aza said in understanding. Yeah, the devils might try to steal Asia, and we just got her. I don't mind waiting, Asia assured with an endearing smile before looking suitably embarrassed. Um, may I ask a favor though? Shoot, Issei ran casually. I don't know much about magic, but is it possible to soundproof your room? Asia asked awkwardly, blushing scarlet. Issei stiffened, blushing as well while looking at Aza, who blinked. Oh, right, she said idly. Knew I forgot something when I was setting up this double room. So, you've been hearing us. Issei inquired vaguely to Asia, who nodded without looking up. We are so sorry. I, it's quite alright, really. I just, um, don't want to eavesdrop on your intimate moments, Asia said shyly. Right, humans need to sleep every night for six hours or nine. Aza asked Issei curiously. Issei just cupped his face, trying not to smile too much. Also, Asia started again. I think you'd like to live here, with your family, Issei. I if that's alright. H huh? Oh, yeah, right. Not sure how we're going to figure that all out, Issei mused, glancing at his eldritch girlfriend. Unless, Yag will probably have already done it months ago next week, Aza confirmed with a smile. At Asia's confused look, Issei sighed. Time God, he answered as an explanation. Oh, Asia said softly, pausing in consideration. My mind still hurts thinking about it. Yeah, you'll get used to it. I think Issei reassured half-heartedly. Meanwhile, thank you again for giving us a ride on the Gremory's train, Ria's, Sona said with a sigh. Think nothing of it. We're both in the same boat right now, having to fly home like this, Ria's remarked, glancing out the window. Did everything go smoothly? As smoothly as it could, Sona said, rubbing the bridge between her eyes. Which is to say, not at all. I'm sure everyone will wonder where the student council and some of the most popular students in school suddenly vanished to. I would have done this more carefully in a less extreme situation, a member of my peerage leaving school every month or two. Ria's nodded in understanding. At least the students will have some explanation. All the humans we make contracts with will just be wondering why we no longer answer their summons. Amazing how meaningless that all feels with what's going on, Sona remarked with a frown. How is Kaneko? Better. A lot better now, Ria's confirmed with a smile. Leaving her ears and tail out helps a lot. Was that on the advice of Issei Haidu? Sona asked knowingly, silence being her answer. I don't spy on you, Ria's, but when keeping an eye out for things, it's hard not to notice him entering your clubhouse. Ria sighed. We requested help with Kaneko's condition. No strings, no conditions. And almost no sense, Sona said with narrowed eyes. You know very well that meeting with him was dangerous, just be whatever his relationship with the Eldritch Queen is. Are you going to tell my brother? My parents? Ria's asked pointedly, giving her friend a hard stare. Sona raised a brow. Are you going to keep it a secret? Ria's held her gaze for a moment before looking forward again. I don't know, honestly. Sona studied her, curious and concerned. What's your read on him and his company? Ria's glanced up. He was kind. Sona stared for a moment. Issei, the pervert, and all you have to say about him is kind. Ria shrugged. There isn't much else to say. Yes, he's a pervert, and I'm sure he gladly would have taken a feel of us if we offered, she mused. But Sona, he knew he had something over us. That he could ask me for almost anything to help Kaneko. And yet, he did it for free. He actually said he felt responsible, in a way. Sona blinked. That is honestly the best news you could have given me, Sona remarked curiously, getting a questioning look. I'm not sure how much sway he has over Demon Sultana, but if he cares that much, perhaps he'll be able to keep her from doing anything horrible to the world. Maybe, Ria's muse with a small smile. Sona watched that smile closely, but was robbed of the chance of inquiring about it, as the train suddenly came to a stop, causing them both to jerk in their seats. Ria's exclaimed, holding herself steady against the seat. Was that the emergency brake? Sona asked, fixing her glasses back into position as she glanced outside at the purple void. We're still not in the underworld yet. That might have been Gasper, actually, Ria said in concern. If he got too scared, he might have frozen the train. Both noble devils made their way to the neighboring train cart, opening the door to find nothing. Ria's and Sona's eyes both dilated as they looked at a solid wall of pure empty blackness. 
They backed away, their magics flaring on instinct as they sensed something approaching. From the nothing came dark hands in the shape of two massive wings, the feathers an oily, sickly black. Into the train cart they came, revealing the body of a woman. Hair like a shadow, feathers forming makeshift clothes to cover her like a skirt and top. But they were not clothes, for each tip of every feather was stabbed into the body, gentle trails of blood cascading down her form, the rivers moving unnaturally to accent her voluptuous form. Her feet were like a bird's, every talon cracked or broken, and the pupils of her eyes so wide no color could be seen. And around her neck, a heavy collar of ominous metal. Sisters of the Satans, she spoke, her voice as if a lonely, sad breeze. My mistress, the great she, bestows upon you a gift for your return home. Sona narrowed her eyes. I don't suppose we might respectfully refuse. No, you may not, the harpy said, raising her wings high. But you may resist. It will please the great she if you do. Rhea's forced to smirk. That much, we can oblige, she said, sending forth a blast of her ruinous powers. Meanwhile, act, be real with me, are you going easy on me? Issei asked curiously as he climbed up the tree. Bakta tilted her head. I am attempting to conceal myself as well as this form would allow, master. Which says so much and so little, Issei noted with a sigh. He made an effort to train some a little every day, even if it was something as minor as the eldritch version of hide and seek, which was the same as regular hide and seek, except it involved trying to find someone cloaked by reality warping magic. It said a lot about his state of mind with how minor of a difference that felt. Should I hide again, master? Gakta offered idly. Issei nodded absently. Yeah, I, Issei. Issei blinked, hand reaching to his head without any conscious effort on his part. Master? Gakta inquired, the sliver of concern in her voice almost as good as a full exclamation from someone else. Issei remained silent, a frown forming on his face. I just got the feeling that someone asked me for help. Gakta blinked, something she didn't do often. I believe you are hearing a prayer, master. Strange. Mistress doesn't believe you'd be able to for many more years. Yes, I'm an early bloomer, Issei mused with a smile while looking at her. Any advice on how to respond? I am not a god, master, I do not have the slightest clue, Gakta admitted. There, I guess, Issei decided. Issei, please. Why does that sound familiar? Issei muttered to himself. He nearly fell out of a tree as a port suddenly sliced open next to him, Yogg sticking her head out. Issei. Good to see you as always, Yogg greeted casually. Small emergency. Do you mind coming with me? It's about the new voice in your head. I okay? Issei answered uncertainty. What's going on? Hop in and we'll explain everything, Yogg requested, sinking back into her portal. Issei turned to Gakta. Is it just me, or did her smile seem a bit forced? The eldritch servant nodded. The emergency might not be so small, master. And given that this is Yogg, that can't be good, Issei muttered as Gakta took her place at his side. Rolling his neck, he hefted himself to his feet before jumping into the portal, Gakta following after. Okay, Yogg, what's the hay, I know this place. Indeed, Issei recognized the room as one in the occult research club. In it, he found not only Yogg and Aza waiting for him, but a blindfolded Ika talking with a curious Asia. Ika? Were you the one praying to me? Issei asked in confusion. Ika turned to him and tilted her blindfolded head at him. What, right now, Lord Issei? Cause I did a couple of nights ago, but nothing today, she answered in confusion. You don't know what's going on either, eh? Issei asked idly. Lord Issei, with respect, I don't ask when my god summon me, Ika answered with a small smirk. Sorry, no, Asia answered with an apologetic smile. Right, so are we waiting on someone else? Issei inquired, glancing at Aza and Yogg. Not anymore. Issei hummed, turning to see a short woman in medieval attire, complete with a sword. And you would be. Issei, this is Yad Thadag, Yogg introduced with a smile. She's my let's say she's my elder god counterpart. Elder? So, what, a weaker time god? Issei guessed, Yad's face shifting minutely at that. No offense. I do not take offense with facts, my liege, Yad said with a nod. My status, however, allows me to better handle more minute situations than Yogg. So, she's the butcher and you're the surgeon. Issei quipped, offering a half-hearted grin. Yad almost smiled. I appreciate the attempted levity, but we have a matter to deal with, she said, turning to face the outer gods. Beloved, an eldritch attacked the devils on their trip home, Aza explained with a frown. Issei inhaled, his mind flashing to his peers he had seen just days ago. What? Why? What happened? Happening, Yogg corrected, holding up her sword in a reverse grip, the handle pointed towards the roof. A glow formed on the edge, projecting a magic orb above it, showing, is that a flying train? Issei asked curiously. The supernaturals are fond of many modern technologies, Yogg answered with a shrug. This dimensional train belongs to Rhea's Gremory's family, and was being used to take the devils to the underworld. 
The image shifted to show two black orbs had formed around the train, stopping it in its tracks. Aza spoke up again, eyes on Issei rather than the viewing orb. While they are all still on the train, they are very obviously under attack. Okay, so what now? Issei asked, a bit alarmed. Can't you just call them off, Aza? That's the problem, Yad said as she stepped forward. These orbs temporarily make the spaces within their own separate realities. Breaking it would be child's play for an outer god, let alone our queen. The problem is that if we do we'll probably kill everyone inside in the process, Yogg explained sheepishly. Yeah, but you're you, Yogg. Can't you just rewind time or slow it down for them while you work? Issei suggested in bewilderment. Yogg glanced away now. Not this time, no. The eldritch god powering this isn't just resistant, she's immune to my powers. Issei blinked at that, glancing at the black orbs again with an intense look. With a frown, he turned his look to Aza. It's her, isn't it? Nyarlathotep, yes, Aza answered with a sigh, causing Aika to shiver at the mention of that name. She's not in there, but she is definitely behind this. So, what now? Issei asked, completely at a loss. Why did you want me here, exactly? An eldritch servant would be able to worm into those realities without bursting them. Gacha should be able to deal with whatever is in there, Yogg supplied, waving to Azatha's priestess. And you didn't want me alone, right? Issei asked with a frown at Aza. Aza blinked at Issei's displeasure. No, Issei, I would have simply come to you for that. I just thought you wanted to be informed since you tried to help them before. Oh, Issei said, his minor annoyance evaporating. I appreciate that, I do. But why are Asia and Ika here as well? That, we don't know, Yogg admitted, looking at Yad. She brought them here. I assumed that Asia's healing might be needed. Yad glanced between Yoga and Issei for a moment before answering. While the crawling chaos obscures Yogg's farsighted gaze, it doesn't block my nearsightedness as much, to a point. Meaning? Aza asked with a head tilt. I know what the king is planning, Yad answered, glancing at the lover of Azathoth. Issei saw where this was going and took a breath. Aza, Yogg, could I slip in there as well? What? Aza asked in alarm, the force of her yell inverting the colors of the room. Oh, you little Yogg muttered, reversing the effect and casting an even glare at Yad before addressing Issei's question. Okay, yes, you could. But you shouldn't, you're not ready. Aza cut in swiftly. You're far from ready. You've gotten stronger, and Drake might be able to make you even stronger, but you're still not strong enough to just jump into a fight with Eldritch that might actually try to kill you. It was a testament that Aza's rant was entirely alarmed and worried, not at all matter condescending. However, it was very concerning that the nearby table seemed to be twisting in actual pain. Asia watched it uneasily, Ika more curious as the furniture grew rough scales, and I above each of the legs. It garbled, it shifted, but it didn't move away from its current position. Issei paid it only enough attention to make sure that it wasn't going to attack the two humans in the room. Aza, I love you and I appreciate how worried you are. But even if I'm going to get my ass kicked, I am going to try to protect them. Oz opened her mouth before stopping, a strange look of nostalgia coming over her eyes before sighing in resignation. I see. I suppose you wouldn't be able to forgive me if I tried to teleport you to some other planet to keep you safe, would you? Aza asked half-heartedly. Not easily, no, Issei said with a small smile. Aza, please. Like you said, the worst that happens is I die and I have to wait around for a new body. And everything faded to dust while everyone he ever knew died as Eon stretched on. He tried not to think about that, it'd just distract him. Aza took a deep breath and nodded. Fine, fine. And I understand why Yad brought them here. Well, Asia is for healing, obviously, Issei reasoned. What is Ika here for? The cultist leaned forward in intense curiosity. We need her to pray to you while you're in there, Aza answered honestly. Because they are separate realities, it's possible that you might reappear somewhere else after they pop. Like in outer space, in another galaxy. Issei inhaled that. Don't worry, you're immune, the various reasons a human would die in space, Yogg assured idly. But Ika's prayer should form something of a guiding line home for you to sense. You know, so you can bring the devils back safely. Issei sighed, mentally preparing himself for this. Right, yeah. Kind of the whole point of this. So, what now? In response, Yad turned her European sword, slicing a rectangular shape into the air. A dark corridor-shaped portal formed, looking as if to draw in and drain all color around it. You'll impact the barrier through here. You may struggle some, but getting through should ultimately not be an issue, she explained, looking at Issei for a moment. I already have the passage of time in this room, you may take some time to prepare yourself, my liege. Aza took a deep breath before marching over to Gakta, placing both hands on her servant's shoulders. Gakthorshivkst, if anything horrible happens to my beloved, I will tear you apart, she warned, her tone more urgent than warning, teeth forming along her fingers. 
My mistress, I would sooner dismember myself and offer up the S to you than allow my master to come to harm, Gakta vowed solemnly. Issei sweat dropped at the exchange, not sure what to even say to that as he glanced at Yog. Any advice? He asked curiously. Against Nyerly? No, even though she doesn't always know what she's going to do, Yog informed with a shrug. Whatever is in there isn't too powerful. Certainly not a god. Some pet Nyerly sliced on them for fun no doubt. Kill it, or them, and the barrier should break. Got it, Issei said, trying to fight off the nervous feeling in his gut. Issei, Asia spoke up, looking at him with a searching gaze. I perhaps I shouldn't pry, but I just wanted to ask. Why do you want to help them? Are they your friends? Issei shook his head at that. No, I barely know them really. But I'd feel like an ass if all I did was stand back and not do anything if I could. Besides, I'm apparently the king of the Eldritch. So, it kind of feels like I'm supposed to help clean up this mess. Asia smiled, her gaze touched an understanding. Please be safe, Issei. I don't think Lady Aza will take it well if you're too hurt. No, I will not, Aza said as she walked up to them. Aza, Issei started, only to be interrupted by her pulling him into it deep, both of them closing their eyes at the rather passionate moment. The other eldritch didn't react to the display, while Laesia blushed and glanced away, and Ika made a brief praying motion toward the divine pair. You don't need to explain yourself to me, Issei. If this is your will, so be it, Aza assured, leaning her head against his shoulder. Just come back so you can take me to bed and forget that I was ever worried about you. Issei grinned, hugging her tightly. Deal. Just keep going until you get to the other side of the barrier. You'll be on the train when you do. That's what you said. Still, no one had bothered to warn Issei that it would be like trying to walk through three feet of snow. It wasn't cold or anything, just thick. Goopy. It was like the black void around him was somehow a form of oozer slime, something he had to push and slog through to get anywhere. Not impossible. Not even difficult, not really. But it made everything feel slow. He tried to call out to Draeger Gakta, but he couldn't speak. There was no air. And he didn't know how to use telepathy or anything yet. He could still feel Drake's presence and faintly see Gakta, but that was it. He was eldritch enough to make it through this unharmed, but still too human for it to be easy. How long had they gone on? Hours. Days, maybe. Minutes. It's been only minutes. Issei blinked. Had he thought that? It sounded like his thoughts, but how did he know that? How could he be sure? He didn't know, he didn't care, he just gritted his teeth and drudged on through the shield. The shield trying to keep him out. Trying, and failing. But the great shattering noise, they suddenly emerged into reality again with Issei stumbling forward, before he came to lean on a wall and steady himself. Geez, is this what astronauts feel like? He asked himself, suddenly having the sensation that he had been weightless just a moment ago. Well, just like you said, it's a train, he mused, looking at the door to a train compartment. But that, he looked back at Gacha, who was already standing there, ready for his next move, as the shattered barrier behind them slowly pieced itself back together. The priestess of Azathoth nodded to her master. Issei took a deep breath, Drake's gauntlet forming on his arm. Calm yourself, Issei, and trust your instincts, Drake cautioned. I'll keep that in mind. Just tell me if you know anything important about whatever we're fighting, Issei requested, getting a hum of confirmation. With that done, he reached forth and opened the door. The sound of battle echoed in his ears. Lightning leapt from Akeno's fingertips. Swords broke in Kiba's hands only to be replaced by another. Kaneko fought like a vicious, terrified animal. Bats swarmed around them, causing their enemies to freeze as if paralyzed. There were about a half dozen other girls that Issei didn't know, but looked familiar as they cast off their own attacks. There was another guy as well, using some kind of blue magic whip to attack and hold their foes off. Killed, killing, kill them. Suffering, suffering, suffering to the winged ones. Said foes were definitely eldritch. They were like pairs with five legs around their base, and the top had long whips or tentacles with spikes on them. Each was only the size of a person, but there were dozens of them, having torn away the roof and walls of the train cabin. Though the devils were holding strong, they were backed against the other side, many of them bloodied and wounded, as the eldritch circled in front and above them. Some of them looked close to terrified, especially Kaneko. Hey, uglies. Issei yelled at the sightless creatures. Issei? Akeno said in shock as Issei caught a tendril with his armored hand. Issei yanked, making the creature stumble back and let out a mouthless scream as blood came out from the base of the tentacle. Gakta, can you deal with the rest outside? Yes, I can. Be safe, master, Gakta answered simply, her form cloaked in shadow and mist as she leaped into the air, taking flight to thwart off those crawling all over the train. Issei kept his focus on the ones in front of him, heaving his arms up and slamming them down, sending a wave through the tendril that bounced the creature off its feet. The Kendo took the chance to fry it with lightning. Another tried to take her hand, but Kiba was able to cut off the attacking leg. Who dared, daring, dares to thwart or punished, punish, punishing of these wretched. 
one of the creatures demanded, seeming at Issei. Friend of theirs, so you're on my list now, Issei said in warning. You can leave if you want though. Though for the legs, Drake whispered. Those s are we can these things start panicking if they can't stand up. Got it, Issei acknowledged under his breath. The creatures screeched, leaping at him with speed that he would have deemed impossible before Aza. It started to feel very slow to Issei. He couldn't move that fast himself, but he could see it coming now. Just as they would have barreled him over, he leaped up, kicking one in the side and sending it tumbling back. He came down, landing a dragon fist on the knee of another pear dritch. It let out a horrible noise as the broke clean off in a spray of green blood. Another tried to essay from behind with the many fingered ends of their s, but he managed to barely wrestle it off of him, turning around and twisting the hand with disturbing ease. He inhaled sharply as a tendril almost got around his throat before it froze for some reason. Ducking away, he turned to see Kaneko on top of the beast, ripping the offending tendril out as bats flew around her. Are you okay? A voice came from the bats. Not one of them, but all of them at once. That was the least surprising thing he had seen in a week if he was honest. Um, yeah. Thanks for the save. Issei said, offering a thumbs up and getting a nod from Kaneko, clearly less unnerved now. With that, he struck at the creature's legs before taking a glance at the others. They weren't having as easy a time damaging the creatures, but they were going for the legs now, slowly whittling away at their foes, until they were mostly rolling on the ground like dropped oranges. Someone screamed. One fell from above and snatched at a white-haired girl, one who wasn't Kaneko, and began twisting her arm. If she had been human, her arm would have already been ripped off. Give me some boosts. Issei called, his speed and strength increasing suddenly as the boosted gear's power flowed through him. He rushed the Eldritch, his gauntlet pulled back in a fist, delivering a mighty punch. The beast screeched as the impact ripped through its body, a glory hole bursting out the other end as it slumped over in death. The green blood sprayed over Issei's arm. He pushed his distaste aside as he looked down at the sheet devil. You okay? Why? Thanks, she said awkwardly as she got to her feet, holding her arm in pain. Issei looked back and saw that with what s they still had, the injured creatures began to crawl away into their own shadows, disappearing from sight. Okay. Everyone alive Issei called out as he caught his breath, looking around for any stragglers. Thanks to you, yes, Akeno said gratefully. Issei hi do, I take it. Another said, with long hair and glasses. Issei started, recognizing her but taking a moment to put a name to the face. That's me. Tsubaki, the student vice pres, right. She nodded stoically, before bowing respectfully. Thank you for your aid, Lord Haidu. Yes I'm going to have to get used to that, Issei murmured awkwardly. You should be groveling, bat-winged worms. Issei almost groaned at Gakta's tone, hearing her descend behind him, making all the devils tense. Everyone ignores her. She's with me, Issei requested, turning to Gakta. Gakta did you the? Issei turned fully in surprise. In place of the unnerving young woman was very, very alien woman. Her skin was an impossibly pale gray. She was clad in a black material that appeared like cloth in some spaces, like armor in others, and fully part of her body regardless. Her eyes were covered by what could be a horn helmet, or it might simply be part of her body. Her luscious were on full display, concealed not by cloth or armor, with only the covered by pieces of the black material, acting more like pasties than anything. Gotcha. That you? Issei asked in surprise. By form unhidden, master, she answered, falling to one knee. The Lashans have been disposed of, dead or subdued. What are your orders, master? Right, just going to have to ignore this for now, Issei decided as he turned back to the devils, giving them a once-over before frowning. Please tell me Riaz and Sona went ahead of you guys. At their looks, he knew they hadn't. They were in the compartment behind us, but we couldn't get through to it, Kiba informed, motioning to the door. It was already open, now that Issei looked, but showed only a solid blackness. Issei raised an eyebrow as he walked over, reaching out to the emptiness only to reach a barrier. The hell. Gacha, is this just the way out or something? The eldritch woman approached in an instant, the devils giving her a wide berth, which she ignored as she reached the blackness. Hmm. Master, it is another pocket realm. In this pocket realm? Issei asked incredulously, sighing as she nodded. Great. Exception. Just make sure we can get through without anything exploding. Er, or imploding. Any kind of plotting. As you wish, master, Gakta answered. Issei shivered a bit at having such a beautiful and otherworldly woman calling him master, but pushed his libido aside as he turned to face a train full of teenage devils. Scared, relieved, but also very confused. Akeno and Tsubaki approached him, Akeno more serious than usual. Not that we're not grateful, Issei, but why are you here? What's going on? Akeno asked as neutrally as possible. Issei rubbed the back of his neck. It's not us or a war or whatever you're imagining, Issei said with a frown. One of the Eldritch decided to stir up trouble and decided that you were all a good way to do it. I'd ask their name if I didn't value my sanity, Tsubaki remarked. How bad is this? 
Well, they made this pocket space around your train so that outer gods like Haza couldn't just will it away without killing everyone inside, Issei elaborated, making them stiff. As they talked, the others watched on. So, that's Issei. Sanji remarked with his arms crossed. The guy that is supposed to be dating this Aza. Akta's head snapped like an owl to stare at Sanji. The hand came over his mouth at the same time, prompting the Eldritch to return to her study of the barrier. Don't say her name, idiot. Tomo said quickly. Sorry, I just really don't get this forbidden name stuff, Sanji said with a grimace. Why is he here though? I'm glad he is, and so is my arm, Momo said, nursing her wounded appendage. You okay? Anything broken? Kiba inquired as he approached her. Momo shook her head. No, I don't think so. Just sprained. No offense, Kiba, but shouldn't you be looking out for your own right now? Sanji remarked, nodding to the seats on the other side of the train. The swordsman followed his gaze and saw Gasper curled up in front of the seats, holding the ruined remains of his box. Kaneko was kneeling on the seat, watching Issei with a hawk-like focus. Kiba was concerned for the vampire, but Kaneko. He was surprised by how good she was doing. If anything, she was doing better than even before the attack happened. Master Gacta spoke up, cutting them all off. The source of both barriers is within the second pocket realm. Of course, Issei said under his breath, not even surprised. Can we get in? Yes, Master, Gacta answered, turning to rise with unnatural grace. But they cannot. What? Tsubaki asked with a scowl, others voicing their discontent at being unable to help their mistresses. I almost expected that, Issei admitted. Does this complicate things? No, Master, Gacta confirmed. But it will only allow one Eldritch to enter. Any more, and both fields will fail and kill them all. Does that mean we're going to die either way? Kaneko asked with a blunt scowl. Akta glanced eyelessly towards the Nico devil before looking to Issei again, who was giving her a questioning look. No master. They should survive if the source is dealt with. Well, I'm getting the feeling she's calling me out on purpose with the setup, Issei murmured with a head shake. Gakta, stay here. Master, it would be better for me to deal with this, Gakta insisted. Mistress would not want you to risk your form. Akta, if you happen to lose over there, they'll all die. I don't know how to make a shield or anything against the barrier collapsing, except maybe trying to punch it, Issei countered forcefully. You can at least get them back to Earth, right? Master, that is not Gakta started, only for Issei to step closer to her with a stern look. Then you or not? He asked pointedly. Yes, I might be able to, Gakta answered slowly. Better than nothing, Issei decided. Is there a reason you're risking your life for us? Issei turned to see Akeno approaching him curiously. Or is this just out of the kindness of your heart too? She asked with an interested twinkle in her eye. No, and yes, Issei answered with a shrug. I helped Kaneko because I felt bad for her. I'm doing this because I want to help. Do you know what's through there? Akeno asked carefully. Not a clue, Issei admitted bluntly. Akeno nodded before leaning into his ear. Bring them back safe, and I'll. Issei flushed as he heard Akeno's rather descriptive offer before coughing. You'd have to fight Aza for that, we haven't done that yet. Akeno raised both eyebrows at that. But you have done the deed, with her. Yes, we, Issei answered, trying not to sound too smug. The Keno could only stare in uncomprehending amazement. If you're both done being pervs. Issei's eyes shot down to look at Kaneko, staring up at him. How much of what she said? Every word, Kaneko said, giving a Keno a sideways look, eliciting a giggle. Thank you for coming. With that, Kaneko hugged Issei. It was brief, it was quick, and then she pulled herself away and walked away. Okay, that happened, Issei remarked in surprise as he stared at Kaneko's back before shaking his head free. I should get going. No telling what's happening to those two. Don't sell them short, Akeno said with a small smile. Wouldn't dream of it, Issei said, turning with a wave. I'll try to make this quick. But that, he turned to head to the barrier, pausing to stand near Gacha. Are you sure about this, master? She asked with a frown upon her dot. About as sure as I am that this form of yours is hot, and I'd like to see it more often, Issei remarked. Just, if something happens to me. Try to get them back, and don't let Azamine break them. Akta tilted her head ever so minutely. Right, I'll rephrase, making sure she knows I don't want her before letting her, Issei corrected in amusement. That much I can do, Master Gakta accepted with a bow of the head. Please hurry back. Mistress will be displeased if you are not sharing a bed tonight. Issei smiled at that. If that wasn't motivation to make it out of this with his body intact, nothing was. With a deep breath, he pushed through the barrier and instantly found himself on the other side, facing the door to another train cart. Issei frowned at the ease of that. Definitely calling me. He was interrupted as half of the door and the wall next to it exploded in a red glow, causing him to jump against the opposite wall. Out. He said, pushing the remains of the door aside to peek inside. There was a woman with wings for arms and talons for legs, wearing clothing that appeared to be her own feathers stabbed into her body. 
In front of her were Rias and Sona, both injured with parts of their clothes destroyed. Sona's stomach was exposed, her skirt barely holding together, while Rias had one of her beauties on full display. Both were breathing heavily, clearly exhausted. The sight of Say would have enjoyed normally, if not for the blood and danger involved. The great she cannot be denied, princesses of devils, the harpyish woman said ominously, raising her wings, the feathers forming into dark hands, and otherworldly energy forming between them into a ball. Okay, yeah, no, Issei decided, holding up the boosted gear, feeling the power drawing into it. Red energy swirled around Rias, only for both she devils to become surprised as a green energy ball launched into their opponent's unfinished attack, causing it to explode prematurely. The dark harpy, unfazed by her own attack, turns to glance at the newcomer. Issei. Rias called out in surprise. You're. Sorry I'm late, Issei said as he walked in, trying to act more confident than he was sure he should feel. I take it you're working for the gnarly. Bold and foolish to call the great she as such, the dark harpy said idly. Who are you? If I told you I'm dating the queen of the eldritch, would you give up? Issei offered with a shrug. The silence he received was answer enough. Didn't think so, Issei said with a sigh. Who are you, anyway? My name is gone. I am only a servant of the great she. You may call me. Her introduction was interrupted by a wave of destructive red energy aimed at her head by Rias. She raised one arm, the feathers of the wing acting as a shield as the power exploded. The Averitress, she finished, scowling at the devils. I have not forgotten you are here, sisters of the Satans. Shame, Sona said, a blue magic symbol forming in front of her outstretched hand, sending out a burst of water in the form of snakes, ensnaring and biting into one of the legs. The Veritress didn't even flinch, pulling her leg free and spinning to catch a punch from Issei with her talons. Worth a shot, Issei murmured as the claws held steadfast to his arm. Was it? A Veritress asked, her right arm shifting and changing to form a large tooth mouth along the span of the wing. Shit. Issei cursed, grateful as a boost from Drake kicked in, giving him a chance to kick up at the leg holding in, a sickening crack sounding off before he was released. But before he could get away, the teeth of the wing maw came down and sliced into his right arm, leaving a deep and bloody gash. With a hiss of pain, he leaped away, joining Rias and Sona on their side of the cart. Are you okay? Rias asked with a frown, her hand raised, ready to cast another attack if and when needed. Before Issei could answer, the bleeding stopped and formed a long, narrow spike crystallized in appearance, blazing orange in color. And most surprising of all, the sharp and burning pain in his arm was gone. Um, apparently, he answered in surprise. His attention returned to a veritress in full as she snapped her leg back in place, her wings still chomping at the air as she gazed at them. Well, that didn't work. Any ideas? Issei asked idly as he got to his feet again. We've been doing everything to hold her off until now, Rias answered with a frown. Rias' powers have more of an effect than mine, Sona informed, glancing to the floor where many scorched and discarded feathers lay. But she seems to have recovered from everything. Yeah, well, thanks to how she set this trap up, we're on our own, Issei warned in advance. You could always give in, a veritress offered hollowly. It would be easier for you to accept what will happen. How encouraging, Rhea said derisively. Issei stared intently at a veritress, for once completely ignoring his perversion as he looked at such a scantily clad woman, mostly because she might just kill him if he wasn't careful. Still, how did they stop here? Just keep hitting her until she doesn't get back up. There had to be some weak points. There. Issei stilled at the voice in his head, glancing down at Drag. That you? Um. Drake made a noise of confusion, answering Issei's own question. Looking back at the Averitress, he felt his eyes drawn to her stomach, a space right above the dot he could feel it more than see it, something there her eldritch heart perhaps. Or the source of her power. He didn't know. Just that he had a target. Stab her there. His gaze drifted back to his arm and his newly grown spike. Well, if you want the cub, enter the cave, he muttered, flexing his gauntlet. Ladies, I have an idea. Just try to give me some cover. You sure? Sona asked skeptically. It's worth a shot, Issei answered casually. Don't worry about us, Rias assured, her ruinous power flaring. Make peace with your souls, before they are extinguished, a veritress warned as she held her arms up and sped towards the trio. All at once, the she-devils let loose attacks of crimson and azure, barreling toward their enemy, but a veritress did not slow, her more normal wing raised to shield her as her charge continued. Sensing him before she saw him, a veritress hurled her arm out to bite at Issei, attempting to hit him from the side. Not happening, Sona said, her water serpents shooting forth to the toothy, pulling it back. The Veritress frowned, her first facial reaction, before launching out her legs. Issei gritted his teeth, holding back a scream of pain as he felt the talon stabbing into his lower leg, feeling like she was about to rip his shinbone actually, that was probably exactly what she would do if he gave her the chance, he realized. Still, there was little to do as he fell to one knee. Give in, and I'll make it quick, a Veritress offered coldly. 
Oh, Jay just off, Isane muttered through the pain as he reached up to the spike in his shoulder. Hmm? A veritrous item strangely as Isay slumped over and the gauntlet glowed green for a moment, power flowing into the spike before it suddenly expanded, stabbing into a veritrous's stomach and hitting the mark. Ashi she gasped out wordlessly as blood poured through her mouth and wound. Isay grunted as he snapped the spike off at his shoulder, leaving it stabbed through a veritrous. Her legs slowly, tremblingly released his blood rushing from Isay's injuries before quickly sealing in a red mesh. The Veritra stumped backward, falling to her knees, reaching for the improvised weapon, the itcher spike beginning to fill with a twisted blackness. She made to pull it out until she was surrounded by red symbols. Issei, move. Rias called out in warning. Moving. Issei acknowledged, using his one good leg and all the strength being a budding eldritch afforded him, landing outside of the area of attack. Between her wound and Sona keeping her pinned, a Veritra seemed to have no such chance. But as she was enveloped by the red power of Rhea's ruin, Issei swore he saw the harpy give a small, broken smile before she was engulfed. Issei slowly awoke, he smiled at the familiar and welcoming feeling of Azza lying on top of him. He didn't need to look, he'd know her body anywhere at this point. But he blinked himself away cause realized there was a second body, one that definitely wasn't Azza pulling some self-replicating ability to give him a twin Azza experience. Looking down at his left side, he stared at the long rivers of blonde hair, before realizing that Asia was laying there, hugging his arm. Eyes shifting around the unfamiliar room, he realized he wasn't in his own bed either. Everything started to come back to him now the train, the harpy, saving Rias and Sona and then the flash of light. Well, I guess I pulled that off, Issei murmured to himself with a small smile, using his right arm to come up and run his hands through Oz's hair. Indeed you did, Lord Issei. Issei's eyes shot downward, to the foot of the bed. Laying there was one Ika, still blindfolded and positioned much like a dog at the feet of her sleeping master. Ika. Where are we and what are you doing? He asked with a raised eyebrow. Some bedrooms in the occult clubhouse. And this was my reward for helping you come home, she answered, sitting up and starting to stretch. I normally would say serving is reward enough, but getting to sleep at the feet of my gods. How could any good bitch refuse that? Ika asked with a smirk. I'm not going to argue with that logic, Issei answered awkwardly. Because you enjoy the idea of having a pet girl leashed to your bedpost, right, my lord? Ika asked with a grin. Ah yes, but that's beside the point, Issei deflected, feeling himself growing aroused, his erection almost poking Oz's belly. How long have I been asleep? Just a few hours, Ika answered, crawling up and revealing her shirt was unbuttoned to reveal her pink bra underneath. Issei raised an eyebrow but merely watched as she leaned over Asia's sleeping form, staring at her through the fabric over her eyes. Brave little thing. Your nun's been in a trance since you got back, healing you. Was I that beat up? Issei asked in surprise. You were growing a third arm there for a moment, Aika answered before smiling perversely. Or, fourth arm to be accurate. Issei rolled his eyebrows as he looked down at Asia, realizing for the first time he could hear her mumbling in her sleep. What's she saying? Prayers, Aika answered, looking very amused as she pushed a strand of Asia's long hair behind the ear. Mostly from the Bible, but some eldritch ones have been slipping through. I doubt she even realizes it. We're passively brainwashing her? Issei asked idly. I don't think so, Aika answered with a hum. I think her faith is just slowly moving to you and Aza. Still weird to think about, Issei mused. Where is everyone else? Don't worry about that. Issei gave a small smirk as he looked down at Aza. Thought you were awake. Let's just lay here for another week or two, Aza said in a sleepy voice, her hair melding with the bed. You saved the devils and kicked Nyerly's bird. That's enough for now, right? You do remember about school, right? Issei recalled wryly. Aza grumbled something that, while adorable, Issei was certain was an otherworldly curse. Fine, fine, she said, sitting up and stretching, tugging her hair out of the bed. Should I get you anything, oh great center? Aika asked, bowing her head low to Aza. You brought me back my Issei, I'm good, Aza waved off, hugging onto his side. Where is Yog? She's late for once. At that cue, there was a knock at the door, to everyone's surprise. Sharing a look with everyone, Issei shrugged and called out to the door. Um, come in. In walked an eldritch of time, but it was not Yog. Instead, it was Yad, who walked up to the bed with a stoic expression. Unlike Yog, I have manners, Yad explained simply. We decided to switch for now, in case any of the Satans are suddenly trigger happy. Ah. That means she took Rias and everyone home while I was asleep. Issei asked with a raised eyebrow. Not exactly, Aza answered, snuggling into his shoulder. There were two pocket realms, weren't there? Yes. Issei answered with a raised eyebrow. Rias Gremory and Sona Citri were pulled back here with you, Yad explained. But the rest of the devils were not. Issei glanced around, trying to get a red on everyone. They're not dead, right? No, no, Aza answered, waving him off, and he was sure her hands were flippers for a moment. 
If they were, Gakta would be hurt or dead too. She's fine, so they should be too. Hence why Lady Yogg is searching hell in the neighboring realms, I could comment it demurely. It's where they most likely are. Well, that's not great, but good at least, is Save decided, knowing it was better than it could have been. Aza. Are you okay? Your form's shifting more than normal. Well, you know, normal for when we're not doing it. You mean doing me, Aza countered, brushing her arm to turn scales back into skin. It's high emotions in general. I've gone from worried senseless to incredibly happy, so my form is a bit less stable than I'd like. Right, sorry, Issei said in apology. So, how are Ria's and Sona doing? Sleeping, Yad answered, nodding to Asia. Thanks to some non-Euclidean magic, she's able to heal all three of you at once. Wait, I thought I wasn't in that bad of a shape. Why didn't she just heal them first? Issei asked curiously. Aika and Yad both looked at Aza pointedly. Ah, right, stupid question. She's your healer, not theirs, Aza said simply. So, you get priority. Don't worry, I could have kept them in a temporal stasis if needed, Yad assured. I'm currently hoping that you locate their servants before they wake up. What do we do if they're not in hell though? Issei asked with a frown. Do we have to worry about that now? Aza asked with a grumble, arms crossed all six of them. Actually, my queen, this might be to your liking, Yad stated, getting blinking eyes from the queen. If they're not in hell, they were flung to the Agson. The Agson Aza suddenly had a very white and happy smile. I'm slightly concerned, Issei said, despite his fond smile. Oh, nothing. It's just, I might have an excuse to take us on our first date to another planet. Oz exclaimed with a pleased tone. Meanwhile, Sona woke, eyes opening suddenly. Her mind calmed as she saw the familiar ceiling and walls of Rhea's clubhouse. More specifically, the private room Rhea's had there. Thus we made it back safe, even if it wasn't where we wanted to be, she said as she sat up and immediately realized two things. One, Rias was sleeping on the other side of the bed. Two, they were both in their underwear. Well, this brings back memories, she remarked with a brief smile, recalling their sleepovers as children. Glancing around more, she found there were two pairs of uniforms at the edge of the bed. As she rose to get dressed, her fellow devil began to stir. Bikeno, is that you? Rias murmured as she eased her eyes open. Off by a lot, Sona answered, fixing on her skirt. Sona. What Rhea stopped, sitting straight up. The train. The harpy and Issei. We survived. Evidently, seeing as we're back at Kuo, Sona pointed out, finishing her clothes. Hmm. So we are, Rhea said, finding her clothes and putting on her top first. Any idea what happened after the fight? If everyone is alright. I just woke up, we both have the same information, Sona explained, glancing at the door. I suppose we should see if our saviors can tell us anything. It's been a while since I've seen you without glasses, Rias commented idly, standing to finish her clothing. Pretty sure they were destroyed back in the train. It's not an issue, Sona remarked, both of them knowing she had no actual sight impairment. That wasn't to say she didn't have to resist the urge to push up glasses she no longer had. But both dressed, they cautiously made it out of the room in search of the Eldritch. It felt so strange being on guard in Rias' place of power, but there was no telling just what Eldritch was here. Humming to the meeting room, they both shared a look at the door before opening it. Bugs. Seriously, why are so many Eldritch bug based? I thought tentacles were the main thing. Issei asked in bewilderment. I think that might have been my doing, Aza said thoughtfully, finger to her chin. One of the only races I descend was insect based. Ah, I miss my chance in Zada. The room got extremely heavy, dark, and gloomy, as the Eldritch Queen suddenly underwent a mild bout of depression. Rias and Sona nearly doubled over as they felt the worry in the back of their hearts grow into a stabbing pain, the uncertainty of not knowing what happened to their servants, becoming a true fear of their deaths. Hey, you okay? Issei asked in concern, placing a hand on Aza's shoulder, having no idea what she was talking about, other than it made her sad. Aza that sighed in contentment and happiness as she soaked in Issei's presence. Yeah, yeah, just bad memories. Story for another time. That would be wise, given our company, Yad remarked, glancing at the door and causing all parties to look at it. Rias and Sona steadied themselves as the feeling left, leaving them uneasy as they took in the scene in full. Issei was sitting on the couch. On one side sat a blonde girl who, during Oz's wave of sadness, had clung to Issei's left arm for comfort. She was looking at them with a polite smile. Standing next to the couch was a girl in a medieval-styled outfit, complete with a European sword. But the one to Issei's right was the one that had their attention. They had seen her before, they knew exactly who and what she was. But feeling it was a whole other ordeal. Rhea swallowed thickly, fully understanding how Kaneko had nearly lost her mind from just being near this woman. You're both up. That's a relief, Issei greeted as he stood. Are both of you okay? We're fine, Sona assured, trying not to glance at Aza, let alone make eye contact. Thank you. For saving us, your majesties. 
Please, you two were holding her back pretty well before I got there, Issei said humbly. I'm just glad I didn't make an utter ass of myself in that fight. Yes, but who and what was that exactly, if you don't mind us asking? Ria's asked delicately. Some unlucky soul the crawling chaos found, Yad informed as she stepped forward. To answer what you're wondering, I am Yad. I am an elder god with Yog sothoth Yog so Sona stopped herself before saying the name as she schooled her expression. I see. And the blonde girl is indeed human, and she belongs to the Sultana and Sultan, Yad continued. Hello, nice to meet you, Asia said as she approached the devil. I'm Asia Argento. He was well, but belongs. Ria's asked curiously, raising an eyebrow to say. Is she a cultist or personal healer, more like? Long story. She also healed you both, Issei explained. Oh. Thank you then, Ria said thankfully, Sona nodding in agreement. Not to sound rude, but where is everyone else? Or was it just our part of the train? No, but don't worry, everybody was alive before I went to help you too, Issei explained reassuringly. As for where we're still figuring that out. Both devils raised an eyebrow at that, but barely suppressed their tensing bodies, as Aza stood up to join the conversation. They're alive, but they didn't get pulled back here with Issei. Yogg is checking around your home realm first. Thank you, Queen of the Eldritch, Sona said tactfully. We appreciate your continued aid in this matter. My beloved insisted on helping you, and he doesn't like to leave anything half-finished, Aza said, giggling as she leaned on his arm. A-N-N-N-N-Y-T-H-I-N-G. Riaz and Sona both relaxed, more in surprise than anything, as they felt the warping reality around Aza brushing up to Issei, almost like her very power was snuzzling or cuddling with him. You know it, Issei said with a grin, his hand reached up and patted Aza on the head, making her beam. You just had patted Azathoth, Ria said slowly, before quickly covering her mouth in surprise. I'm sorry, that just slipped out. She apologized, hoping that there wasn't any consequence for saying Aza's full name in her presence. Um? For what? Yes, he gave me a head pat. You humans have such interesting forms of affection, Aza said, before reaching up to Issei on the cheek. I still like these ways more t-h-o-u-g-h. So do I, Issei said, reaching down and stealing off her dot. If she still had them, Sona would have dropped her glasses as she watched Aza swoon. It was surreal, watching something so off the scale as Azathoth giggling and stealing s with Issei. The ad cleared her throat, making Issei flush with a sheepish look. Sorry about that, we got a little carried away. We're used to Yag always popping in, so we learned to ignore having an audience. For once, I believe that sounded more perverted than you meant, Ria's remarked, relaxing some with a small smile on her face. Would it be alright if we contacted our families? I'm sure they're confused and worried by now. You may want to wait, Yad remarked, glancing at the door. We should have company in a moment. Company? Issei asked, all looking towards the entrance in anticipation. You mean Yag? Yad remained silent, unable or unwilling to answer. Issei felt it before he saw it, the cracks forming in reality, manifesting as literal cracks of dark light forming on the door. He glanced at Aza, who didn't look worried or concerned in the slightest. So, he took that as a sign that whoever this was, they didn't mean trouble. The door imploded into a swirling vortex of shadows and darkness. Ria's and Sona inhaled sharply as they were assaulted by the image of something huge plumbing mass of tentacles, the vaguest shape of a goat's head, and an unsettling glow from within as a silhouette came forth, and a mop of white hair popped out, revealing the head of a woman with a strangely adorable pair of curled horns on the sides of her head, one arm on the wall, as if she was peeking from around the corner. Oh no Drag whispered in Issei's head. I am not here. I am not here. Chubby. Aza greeted with a wide grin, raising her arms, and they extended just a bit too far to be normal. I thought that was you I sensed. Aza, Chubby greeted with a smile. Sorry to interrupt your honeymoon, but are you by chance missing a dozen or so if she paused and pointed to Ria's and Sona, whatever they are. Devils. And yes, we are, Yad answered. Shub looked at her, causing Yad to look away. Hello, Shub Nigurath. Oh, Yad. I thought you were Yad for a moment, Shub said softly. She was in the underworld, looking for the ones you found, Yad answered quietly. Of course she was, Shub said in disappointment, seemingly speaking of something else, before returning her attention to Aza. Would you mind coming over here? They're being stingy about releasing them. Stingy? Sona questioned skeptically. More like bureaucratic, Yad supplied. We'll be there in a moment, Shub. Will we? Issei asked curiously. Most of us, Aza said, glancing at Asia. She can't come, it's too early for her to be in a place like this. It's alright, Aza, Issei. I had some plans after this anyway, Asia assured softly. Oh? Issei asked curiously. Well, I'm not confident I'll ever become a cultist, but I think I do need to learn more about them, and the eldritch, Asia answered with a bashful smile. But you do. Some of them make your crusaders look like pacifists, Aza said wisely. You actually know about the crusades. 
Issei asked, almost mildly surprised. Oh yeah, all Eldritch do. You have no idea how many knights got tricked into worshipping some of us, Aza said in exasperation. You make that sound like a bad thing for you, your majesty? Sona asked cautiously. It involved certain Eldritch having a proxy war with each other's cultists, Yad explained in annoyance. It was, in a word, a mess. Sounds like it, Issei mused. Still, history fun facts aside, shall we? All parties began to head to the portal, albeit with some unease on Sona and Rhea's part. Do not worry, Yad remarked to them. It's safe for devil minds, just not humans. It wasn't our minds we were worried about, Rhea said idly. But thank you. With that, Issei and Aza stepped through the portal, followed by the devil duo. He wasn't sure what did he find on the other side. Our hospital? Rhea's asked curiously as she looked around the waiting room. I doubt it's just that, Sona stated knowingly, looking at the nurses and doctors walking about, acting as if they hadn't noticed their sudden arrival. Eh? What do you see? Issei asked curiously. You don't? Rhea's asked with a raised eyebrow. Give it a moment. The eldritch camouflage will wear off in a few seconds, Yad answered stoically. True to her word, the world around Sona and Rhea's warped and melted away. Instead of a waiting room, they were in what looked more like a hive for giant bugs. Halls were replaced by winding tubes not only in the walls, but in the ceiling and floor. The material was red and brown, looking like something between organic and rock. Littered over the surfaces were beige crystals that gently lit the areas in an off-color hue. More importantly, the medic personnel all faded away to be replaced by giant insects that looked like the strange offspring of fireflies and cockroaches, their low-hanging rears immersing a soft glow, as their rearmost legs kept them standing with a mix of coordination and balance. Their other 4s had many more joints, allowing them to turn and reach in any direction. Their heads were smooth and had a strange adorableness about them for how their many eyes fit into their heads, their antennae moving where their mouths did not. Sona and Rhea starred, almost surprised by how tame this was, all things considered. There you all are, Shub called out, approaching them with one of the creatures, who had four antennae instead of two. Aza, I'm sure you know Thansatha, she said, waving to the creature, who bowed its head as its antennae shook. Greetings great Azatheth, Yad of Yog, Devils of Earth, Unsa greeted, the melodic voice echoing soothingly in their minds. The many eye orbs moved to focus on Issei. Lord of Azatheth. Sona and Rias looked to Issei with confusion at that rather lofty and confusing title. Yo, Issei greeted me. We're here for Gaktha and the devils that were brought here. Unsa nodded eagerly. This is good. We do not wish to be here. But apologizes, great Azatheth, insistences must be made by the proper scripture. I don't suppose you'd allow me to just put the finished paperwork into existence? Aza asked with a sigh. Insistence must be made, for such things are often tried by those already within, Thunsa answered apologetically. Azatha sighed. Very well. Yad, come and help me write faster. They should at least allow that. Issei, I'll be a minute. You mind keeping Shubby company until I'm done? Aza asked with a resigned smile. I'd offer to help, but I'm pretty sure I need to learn a new language. Issei paused to look at the roach fly creature and probably a new form of communication to even try. These are words that are not false, Thunsa confirmed. Please be at ease and remain nowhere else. The devils watched as Yad and Aza walked over to a tunnel in the ground, stepping casually over the edge and falling down it. Thunsa, however, opened their wings and took to the air, flying into one of the upper paths. With that, Shub awkwardly approached the group. I suppose this is the first time we've met, Shub said, smiling up at Issei. Only now, seeing her with her brown shirt and the white apron over it, did they realize how short her human form was. Not to the point of being considered a dwarf, but she would barely be taller than Kaneko, Rias noted. I'm Shub Nigurath. We've been told. It's a pleasure to meet you, Rhea said carefully. Oh, don't worry. I understand we outer gods are intimidating, Shub said reassuringly. I take no offense, but please be at ease. No one here means you any harm, right? All the same, I'm sorry. I'm Rhea's Gremory, and this is Sona Citri, Rhea's introduced. Gremory, Citri. Important names, I believe, but I'm sorry to say I don't know much beyond that, Shub mused before looking at Issei. Sona and Rhea's nearly fell over as they watched Shub Nigurath, the black goat of a thousand young, bow her head deeply to Issei Haidu. It's a pleasure to meet you, Lord Issei, Shub said with a smile. Please, stop, Issei said with a bashful grin as he waved her off. I'm just Aza's boyfriend. Regardless, it's nice to meet the one that makes Aza so happy, she said genuinely. It's been so long since I've seen her like this. I'm amazed that she learned how to take human form so fast too. Issei blushed a bit under the praise. W well, anyway, thanks for helping with this. Though how did you get mixed up in all this anyway? Oh. It's nothing special really, Shub answered idly. I was nearby and sensed something being hurled between realms, rather unsafely. I made sure they got here in one piece, but when they arrived, the Blatnings were just as confused as me. 
We found one of Asia's warnings. Ria's and Sona did a double take at the term warnings, but Issei and Shub took no notice. Who said that you, Kunger, tasked her with protecting them, Shub finished. Thanks, glad to know we had someone higher up looking out for them, Issei thanked. Yes, truly, thank you, Sona said with sincerity. But may we ask where this is, exactly? According to Aza, in the eye of Jupiter, Issei answered bluntly, obviously still amazed by that prospect as he looked around. First time off planet. Shub asked playfully. Issei could only rub the back of his head boyishly. Riaz knew she was more surprised than she should be. She was born in hell and went to school on Earth. Being to another planet wasn't that strange really, but it was a new experience. Jupiter. Isn't that a gas giant? Riaz asked, glancing at the very solid surroundings. Well, the eye is the size of three Earths, Shub reminded helpfully. And with a small dwarf planet placed inside the storm, it's the perfect place for this. This being, what? A hidden temple to the Eldritch. Sona guessed. Or that's what I assumed by being called unworthy. Oh, no, no. What's the word? A mistranslation. Shub said in thought. The Blattnings rely on telepathy to communicate with other races. However, it isn't always perfect in interpreting their thoughts into your words. Oh? Then what did they mean? Riaz asked curiously. I'm going to make a guess here, Issei pipped in. I think by unworthy they meant wrongly incarcerated. Sona's eyes went wide. This is a prison. More like juvenile detention but yeah, Issei answered with a nod. Aza was telling me about this place earlier. The Ag Sanlin, or Prison of the Red Storm. They mostly keep young, misbehaving eldritch here. The Roach guys are actually doctors, in a way. I guess that's why you both saw this place as a hospital. Sounds more like an asylum, Riaz noted. I'm surprised that the Eldritch would have a place like this. Aza has a very off-handed rule, but even though we have rules and lines we need each other to respect, Shub answered. However, the Blattnings are very firm about making sure all the proper documents are filled out. Riaz and Sona stared for a long moment. I'm sorry, I'm just almost surprised the Eldritch bothered with paperwork, Riaz said idly. Same here, Issei agreed, a morbid thought in his head as he looked at Shub. It's not human skin, right? No, not human, Shub answered simply. Somehow, that's less comforting than it should be, Sona said. The devils not do that. Issei asked curiously, getting surprised looks from them. Sorry, but I literally knew nothing about the supernatural world before Aza. Ah, well, that is a question fresh devil reincarnates often have, Riaz accepted. But no, we don't do that anymore. Anymore being the keyword, Issei noticed with a sweat drop. Thanks for watching this video. If you really enjoy this video. Like subscribe and comment down below and turn on that bell notification. See you in the next video. Goodbye.